They called Apple doomed when Steve Jobs passed away. They said without his bold, visionary leadership, the company would crumble. Critics were quick to predict the downfall of a tech giant known for its innovation led by a visionary who seemed irrepressible. Yet, over a decade later, not only has Apple disproved the naysayers, but it has also soared to become the world's first multi-trillion dollar corporation. How did the company, synonymous with the genius of Steve Jobs, continue to redefine the landscape of technology, innovation and global business? The answer lies with a figure who often remained out of the spotlight, yet was instrumental in steering Apple through its most transformative period. Tim Cook. Welcome to Beginner's Mind. I am your host, Christian Soschner, and today we delve into Tim Cook, the genius who took Apple to the next level, written by Leander Kenny. This biography offers a rare glimpse into the life and leadership of Tim Cook, the man whose quiet resolve and strategic foresight have been pivotal in Apple's continued success. Why did I choose this book? Because beyond the products and the profits, there lies a story of leadership, perseverance and the quiet strength that propelled Apple from a company mourning the loss of its founder to a global powerhouse under Tim Cook's stewardship. For those driven by stories of success, of turning ideas into empires, Apple is an undeniable case study. But the story behind the man who nearly 10 x its value is largely unknown. Understanding Tim Cook's methods, how he expanded services and variables, holds lessons applicable far beyond Apple's sleek designs. In probably the next one and a half hours, get ready to go behind the scenes. We will examine Tim Cook's background, his journey within Apple, but most importantly, the key takeaways you can apply directly to your own endeavors. By the end of this episode, you will gain insights into Apple's explosive growth, Cook's leadership style, and why even investment legends like Warren Buffett are singing his praises. Before we dive into the transformative leadership of Tim Cook, let's talk about who's telling this story. Leander Caney isn't just any biographer. He's a seasoned tech journalist and a leading authority on Apple. But why is he the perfect candidate to narrate Tim Cook's journey? For over two decades, he's reported on the company's innovations, its strategies, and its iconic figures. Kani has developed an intimate understanding of the company's culture, its innovations, and the personalities that have shaped its unprecedented trajectory. His previous books shed light on some of Apple's biggest names. There is Inside Steve's Brain, a deep dive into the mind of the legendary co-founder, and Johnny Ive, a profile of Apple's visionary head of design and the book Cult of Mac. Each of these works offers a unique glimpse into the minds and mechanisms that propelled Apple from a garage startup to a global icon. Through Inside Steve's Brain, Kani reveals how Jobs' singular vision shaped the future of technology, while in Johnny Ive, he illuminates the process behind the products that have delighted millions worldwide. And with Cult of Mac, he explores the unique culture and fan base that Apple has cultivated over the years and built into a huge ecosystem to which they can sell any service and product. This background positions Kani as an unparalleled insider understanding the company's history, its unique culture, and the key players who shape its success. Given his access to Apple's inner circle and his analytical prowess, there's arguably no one better equipped to pen the biography of Tim Cook. Through Tim Cook, the genius who took Apple to the next level, Hani channels his decades of observation and analysis to shed light on a figure who, until now, has remained largely in the shadows of his predecessors. Beyond his books, Kani was formerly news editor for Wired.com and 
is currently the editor and publisher of Cult of Mac, a popular blog dedicated to all things Apple. This long-standing dedicated focus means he has unique insights into the developments, the shifts and the impact of decisions made during Tim Cook's era as CEO. Why does this matter to the listeners and readers of the book? To truly appreciate the magnitude of Cook's achievements, we need a storyteller who has been in the trenches and who has seen Apple's evolution firsthand and understands the enormity of the tasks Cook undertook. Kani's body of work not only establishes him as a credible source on all things Apple, but also as the ideal narrator to chronicle the journey of a man who took one of the world's most watched companies and propelled it to even greater heights. So as we proceed to peel back the layers of Tim Cook's tenor at Apple, remember that we are doing so through the eyes of an author whose life's work has been to decode the mystique of Apple. This makes Kani's insights invaluable to understanding the true impact of Cook's leadership. In Tim Cook, the genius who took Apple to the next level, Leander Kani, paints a fascinating portrait of the man who stepped into seemingly impossible shoes following the death of Steve Jobs. When Tim Cook took the reins in 2011, The world doubted Apple could survive, much less thrive, without its visionary co-founder. Yet under Cook's leadership, Apple experienced a meteoric rise. Not only did he steer the iPhone to unprecedented success, but he also launched new triumphs like the Apple Watch, propelling Apple to become the world's first trillion dollar company. But Kani's book goes deeper than products and profits. It weaves together the story of Cook's personal journey, his relentless dedication to causes like privacy and human rights, and his transformative approach to leadership. We learn how Cook's quieter style emphasizes collaboration, honesty, and a commitment to progress, not just in technology, but in the world at large. Through interviews with Apple insiders and his own decades of in-depth reporting, Kani presents a multifaceted view of Cook and his vision for Apple. The book argues that Cook's contributions are not simply about maintaining the status quo, They are fundamentally reshaping both Apple and the wider tech landscape. Tim Cook, the genius who took Apple to the next level, is an essential read for anyone interested in the evolution of Apple, the secrets of successful leadership, or the impact one person can have on a global scale. The key takeaways after listening to these episodes will be answers to the questions like, Could Apple flourish without jobs? Hmm. Yes, and spectacularly so. Tim Cook, he is not just an operations guru, but a visionary in his own right and leadership redefined. Cook's emphasis on values driven innovation alongside profits. Now, experience more insights into the life of Tim Cook in this episode. And here we are already at the introduction chapter. Killing it. When Tim Cook became Apple CEO in 2011, it seemed an impossible task. Could this quiet, operations focused leader fill the shoes of the iconic Steve Jobs? Could Apple even survive, let alone thrive, without its famed visionary? Leander Kane's book, Tim Cook, the genius who took Apple to the next level, delivers a resounding answer. It paints the portrait of a CEO who defied expectations, transforming doubts into unprecedented triumph. Kani begins with the pivotal moment in 2011, the passing of Steve Jobs and the cloud of uncertainty hanging over Apple's future. Yet within a short few years, Cook silenced the critics. Apple became the first trillion dollar company. 
It's success driven by the runway popularity of the iPhone, the rise of variables like the Apple Watch and a booming service division. But as Kani highlights in the first chapter, the book goes deeper than financial milestones. It explores Cook's leadership philosophy, a stark but effective contrast to Jobs often mercurial style. It examines his commitment to values like privacy, accessibility, and environmental responsibility. These principles are woven into the very fabric of Cook's Apple, even as the company continues to break new ground. Of course, this book was completed in 2018. Does the story of Tim Cook's success continue? Absolutely. Since then, Apple has only grown stronger. Just last year in 2023, Apple released the iPhone 15, boasting even more impressive camera capabilities and processing power, cementing its dominance in the smartphone market. Services like Apple Music, iCloud and Apple TV Plus have seen explosive growth, reaching record subscriber numbers and contributing significantly to Apple's overall revenue. And despite recent market volatility, Apple's stock price remains a testament to its strength, reaching a staggering all-time high market cap of $3.1 trillion in 2023. Most recently, 2024 ushered in the Apple Vision Pro, their foray into mixed reality that set to shake up the tech world yet again. Interestingly, while Cook expanded Apple's reach into new territories, he made the strategic decision to abandon the Apple Car project, demonstrating his discerning eye for where to focus the company's incredible resources. This introduction sets the stage, showing us that Tim Cook isn't just a placeholder, but a true force for innovation and progress in his own right. What's particularly fascinating is how Cook has achieved this while championing a set of core principles that set him apart. Throughout the book, Kani sheds lights on these principles, which form a guiding force as Cook navigates Apple's continued growth. For example, accessibility. The belief that everyone deserves access to technology regardless of ability. Education. A commitment to making quality education accessible to all. Environment, driving environmental responsibility in design and manufacturing. Inclusion and diversity. Fostering a workplace where diverse teams fuel innovation. Privacy and security. The fundamental right to privacy and secure technology. Supplier responsibility. Empowering people within Apple's supply chain while protecting precious natural resources. These principles are the heart of Tim Cook's Apple. They shape the company's products, its culture, and its impact on the world. And they show us a leader who isn't just about profit, but about making a positive difference. The key takeaways from the first chapter for me are that the initial skepticism surrounding Tim Cook's potential to lead Apple after Steve Jobs was very interesting because he entered the stage where nobody believed in him. Apple's unprecedented success under Cook, financially and values-driven, it's undeniable in 2024. Cook's continued evolution of the company even in the most recent years and Cook's unwavering commitment to a clear set of values that shape his leadership. Are you ready to dive deeper into the book? Then let's move on to the first chapter to discover more about Tim Cook's incredible journey and the enduring legacy he's creating at Apple. Chapter one is all about Steve Jobs. And for me, it's a great symbol to resemble 2011, the time when Tim Cook took over and nobody believed he could succeed. This chapter sets the stage for one of the most pivotal transitions in the tech world. On October 5th, 2011, the world held its breath when Steve Jobs, Apple's visionary co-founder, passed away. For Tim Cook, this wasn't just a monumental loss, it was a call he'd quietly prepared for, yet one most thought 
he couldn't answer. So let's step back a little. In that fateful August, Crook's phone rang. This call would change his life. When he picked up the phone, Steve Jobs was on the other end, asking him to come to his home in Palo Alto. Imagine receiving such a call, knowing the weight of what it entails, the responsibility, the expectations and the scrutiny that would follow. Jobs asked him over. Now he said, who knew it was important. He set off immediately to Chop's home. When he arrived, Chop's told Cook that he wanted him to take over as CEO of Apple. This wasn't a surprise. Cook had steered Apple's operations for years. But to outsiders, as Kanye writes, it was widely accepted that after Chop's, the next most visionary person at Apple was not Cook. It was Apple's chief designer, Johnny Ive, but he had no interest in running a business. He just wanted to design products. The board, however, saw differently. Cook was stability. But as Kanye notes, Apple's board was concerned about public opinion. They wanted the world to see what they saw in Cook on page six in the book. Cook stepped in, promising to honor Jobs' vision while hinting at his own approach. In a company-wide email, he wrote, I'm looking forward to the amazing opportunity of serving as CEO of the most innovative company in the world. Steve has been an incredible leader and mentor. And we are really looking forward to Steve's ongoing guidance and inspiration as our chairman. I want you to be confident that Apple is not going to change. Steve built a company and culture that is unlike any other in the world, and we're going to stay true to that. I'm confident our best years lie ahead of us and that together we will continue to make Apple the magical place that it is. But those best years seemed in doubt when Jobs unfortunately died just a month later. President Obama hailed Jobs. Newspapers echoed the sentiment, but eyes turned to Cook, not with admiration, but with doubt. Bandits were quick to predict Apple's demise. Kani sums up the challenge perfectly. Running Apple, Cook would be the most visible CEO in the world, which is a high wire act. An intensely private man, Cook never thought he'd be made CEO, and he certainly never thought he would replace Steve Jobs. The key takeaways in this chapter for me are that Cook, though skilled, lacked uh, Jobs' undeniable charisma in the public eye. Doubters were everywhere predicting Apple's downfall, and Cook wasn't trying to be Steve Jobs, but faced immense pressure nonetheless. And this was the situation when Tim Cook took over Apple. This chapter sets the stage perfectly. It paints a picture of a man quietly ready to defy expectations and prove that innovation didn't die with Steve Jobs. Let's move on to the next chapter. Chapter two takes the reader to the roots of Tim Cook's values and beliefs to the heart of what made him the leader he is today. This chapter isn't just about where Tim Cook comes from, it's about what shaped the man who would defy expectations at Apple. He was born in Mobile, Alabama, a religious boy in the Deep South who excelled in school, but his roots hold deeper insights into his character. As a teen, Cook witnessed a clan gathering firsthand. On page 23, Kani writes, For me, the cross burning was a symbol of ignorance, of hatred, and a fear of anyone different than the majority. I could never understand it. When he noticed a fire by the side of the road, he pedaled closer and saw a burning cross surrounded by clansmen in white hoods and robes. While Ku Klux Klan membership had diminished from an all-time high of 4 million in 1925 to just a few thousand in the early 70s, it was not uncommon to see Klan gatherings in some parts of the South at the time. 
The clansmen Cook witnessed had assembled their flaming cross on the property of a local black family. Without thinking, Cook shouted, Stop! The clansmen all looked at him and one lifted his hood, revealing himself to be a local diacon at one of the churches in Robertsdale. He quickly warned Cook to keep on moving. It was a shocking experience for the young Cook. He recalled this experience when receiving an IQLA Lifetime Achievement Award from Auburn University, his alma mater in 2013. This image was permanently imprinted in my brain and it would change my life forever, he said. For me, the cross burning was a symbol of ignorance, of hatred and a fear of anyone different than the majority. I could never understand it. His experience encountering racism would affect the way the young cook lived his life and would eventually make it into his business practices. This moment etched a commitment to fighting injustice into his soul. Something we see in his outspokenness for LGBTQ rights, racial equality and inclusion at Apple. But Cook isn't just a champion of causes, he's a problem solver. Even his teachers noted his ability to cut through all the junk and get down to the gist of a problem very quickly like Kani writes on page 32. This skill would become invaluable in his meteoric rise. Cook chose Auburn University for its working class feel and focus on industrial engineering. This seemingly straightforward choice was in fact a bold one. While the world had its eyes on established industries, Cook saw the potential of the fledgling PC market. It was a decision showing both his values, aligning with working people and his ability to spot the next big thing. Let's just remember that when Cook joined the personal computer industry in the early 80s, the industry, the entire industry was still young. It practically started in 1977. Auburn's creed also resonated with him. I believe in hard work, in honesty and truthfulness as outlined on page 34. These aren't simply words for Cook, they are reflected in the culture he's built at Apple. Upon graduating, Cook didn't follow the well-trodden path. While peers joined established firms, he took a risk with IBM's emerging personal computer division. This wasn't a popular choice back then. Most thought personal computers were a fad, but Cook's instincts proved him right. The key takeaways for me in this chapter, Cook's values aren't abstract. They stem from witnessing prejudice and inform his actions. He possesses a rare blend, moral compass and a knack for cutting to the core of a problem. Choosing Auburn and the risky personal computer sector shows Cook's bold, independent thinking. This chapter sets the stage. It shows the reader that Cook isn't just a skilled operations guy. He's a leader shaped by strong values and the courage to chart his own path. Quality is essential for taking a company like Apple to unprecedented heights. Let's move on to the next chapter of Tim Cook's journey, learning to trade at Big Blue in Chapter 3. This chapter propels the reader into the era when Tim Cook, stepping into the vast unknown territory of the personal computer industry, the path less traveled. Tim Cook entered the tech scene at the pivotal moment. It wasn't the behemoth it is today. In the early 80s, computers were the exciting new frontier like artificial intelligence is today in 2024. The whole industry started in 1977. While companies like Apple and Commodore had success, most households didn't own one personal computer yet. Cook joined IBM when it released its iconic personal computer, a machine that brought computing into mainstream businesses and sparked the revolution. His timing was clearly perfect. Time magazine declared the personal computer 
its 1982 machine of the year, which was basically a blow to Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs wanted to become Time's person of the year 1982. And Tim Cook found himself in this seismic shift in the tech world. As Kani writes on page 39, that is why Time has decided that 1982 is the year of the computer. This was huge not only for IBM, but also for the entire technology industry. It affected Apple and Steve Jobs specifically. Jobs was upset that he wasn't awarded Man of the Year himself. He had assumed incorrectly that he had secured the title because Apple had become the first computer company to reach $1 billion in annual sales in the same year. But Cook didn't just join a booming industry, he dove headfirst into the riskiest part of it. While others might have sought secure jobs in established sectors, he went to where innovation was happening, the personal computer supply chain. Here he mastered just-in-time manufacturing, a technique pioneered by Toyota streamlining how IBM built computers. It was a bold move and a skill he'd later use to transform Apple. As Henry Ford himself observed, if transportation were perfect and an even flow of materials could be assured, it would not be necessary to carry any stock whatsoever. What sets Cook apart is his cross-functional mindset. While at IBM, he earned an MBA at Duke, recognizing that engineers who understand business make the best leaders. His ethics class at Duke also left a lasting impact, giving him a foundation to build the values-driven Apple we know today. When I think of ethics, Cook explained, I think of leaving things better than you found them on page 47. This stands in stark contrast to the ethical scandals plaguing tech giants today. By the 90s, Cook was at Compaq a rising PC giant. When they adopted a risky strategy, outsourcing manufacturing to cut costs, he was the man who made it happen. And outsourcing back then was not normal. People feared when they outsourced parts relevant to their production process, they lost control over it. So they tried to do everything in-house and hold huge and large inventories. Tim Cook changed that. And it was exactly this experience in just-in-time manufacturing, this move of Tim Cook that caught Steve Jobs' eye. Apple was facing its own manufacturing problems and Jobs saw in Cook a kindred spirit, someone who understood the power of efficient production. The key takeaways in this chapter for me were Cook's timing was impeccable. He joined tech at its most disruptive moment. He did anything but didn't play it safe. Mastering cutting-edge supply chain tactics was a calculated risk. His cross-functional mindset, engineering and business, is what makes him such a strong leader. This chapter shows to the reader that even before Apple, Hook was someone who grasped the big picture, wasn't afraid to take calculated risks and understood the power of streamlining how things are made. Skills that would prove indispensable to Apple's success. Let's explore further how Hook's arrival at Apple transformed the entire company. And let's dive into chapter four. A once in a lifetime opportunity to join a near bankrupt company. When Tim Cook joined Apple in 1998, it wasn't the tech titan we know today. The company was hemorrhaging money, morale was low, and Microsoft was dominating the market. Jobs had returned, but his Think Different campaign couldn't mask the harsh reality. Apple teetered on the brink of bankruptcy. In the late 90s, as Microsoft dominated the tech landscape, Apple was struggling for survival. Its only lifeline came from an unlikely source, Microsoft itself. 
Despite the tumultuous past, Microsoft's investment in Apple signaled a turning point, albeit one fraught with uncertainty. This was the Apple that Tim Cook decided to join. Page 55 sets the stage. When Cook joined Apple on March 11, 1998, it was not a place where many people wanted to work. The company was near bankruptcy and employee morale was low. Yet it was this daunting scenario that Cook stepped into, driven by a belief in Apple's potential and the conviction that real success comes from tackling the most challenging problems. Cook saw an opportunity where others saw failure. While most sought out thriving companies, he was drawn to Apple's potential. It was a decision that flew in the face of conventional wisdom, even earning a stark warning from one CEO. Cook would be a fool to leave Compaq for Apple. But Cook trusted his instincts. Job's vision, that glimmer of something special, outweighed the risks. Any purely rational consideration or cost and benefits lined up in Compaq's favor, but five minutes into my initial interview with Steve, I wanted to throw caution and logic to the wind and join Apple as described on page 63 in the book. This wasn't just about changing jobs. It was a bet on a man and his vision. Remember, this was the same intuition that led him to the nascent PC industry. Just as Peter Lynch noted in One Up on Wall Street, sometimes the greatest turnarounds are the least expected. And in the 90s, nobody expected Apple to come back ever again. So what a turnaround it would be. Upon joining, Cook faced a mess. Apple's supply chain was bloated. Its product line, Labyrinthine, he took a page from Chop's playbook, but focused on operations. Ruthless efficiency. His transformation plan wasn't flashy. It was methodical, tackling one problem at a time. Inventory was the first target. Warehouses tend to collect product, he observed. He slashed inventory from a month's worth to days, echoing Henry Ford's ideals of just-in-time manufacturing. Cook streamlined, Cook optimized. He forged strong supplier partnerships, moving them closer to Apple's factories. He optimized the supply chain so tightly that within a year, Apple outperformed even the legendary Dell. My key takeaways from this chapter are Cook's decision to join Apple was, practically speaking, a gamble back in the days. A testament to his willingness to take risk and take the road less traveled. He understood that greatness often emerges from fixing the unsexy fundamentals, not grand gestures. His methodical approach, solving one problem at a time, laid the groundwork for Apple's resurgence. This chapter shows that Cook isn't just an innovator, he's a master problem solver. It's this down-to-earth practical mindset that would prove invaluable as Apple stood poised for its next act. Tim Cook's decision to join Apple against the advice of nearly everyone around him underscores a crucial lesson for innovators, investors, and leaders alike. The road less traveled, fraught with uncertainty and risk, can also be the path to unprecedented breakthroughs. Cook's journey with Apple from near bankruptcy to becoming a technology behemoth reminds the reader that greatness often requires stepping out of one's comfort zone and confronting challenges head on. And now let's look into chapter five, saving Apple through outsourcing. Tim Cook didn't just oversee a fix at Apple, he ignited the transformation. By 1998s and the once floundering company was profitable again. This wasn't magic, but a testament to the talents of its key figures. It's the sum of the people. Wozniak, the tech genius, like described on page 70, Jobs, the visionary, and Cook, the manager, and of course, Ives, the designer. Cook's weapon of choice was focus. He brought expertise honed at IBM and Compaq, building a uniquely Apple approach to outsourcing. 
It wasn't mindless offloading. As his colleague noted, they didn't just hire someone and toss the plan over to them. Apple dissected its process entirely, ruthlessly seeking the best partner for each step in the process. This strategy was evident in the IMAX production where Foxconn proved pivotal. With Foxconn, we see Cook's eye for talent even when robbed in a starkly different culture. Founded around the same time as Apple, Foxconn's work ethic was militaristic. It was an unusual synergy. Apple's commitment to human-centered design paired with production discipline. Yet it worked out extremely well, proving that Cook could find excellence where others saw only cultural differences. However, as he championed outsourcing, Cook understood that nothing replaces the human touch. And it's very interesting described in the book, which I didn't know that despite modern tech and robotics, in the words of a former Apple engineer, Hundreds of hands touch a smartphone, regardless if it's an Apple smartphone or Samsung or Google or any other smartphone. It's not automated. Cook sought to harness that power, not erase it. His leadership style mirrored this focus on people. Even if it wasn't warm and fuzzy, he's a very quiet leader, not a screamer. But he will slice you up with intelligent questions, recalls Joss Wieck. His questions weren't meant to intimidate, but to ensure his team had the same grasp of detail that drove him. It was a demanding approach, but not a stifling one. He expected the best, but empowered his people. Let's try harder. Let's try to solve it. You know, we can do it. This drive wasn't limited to the office, but also resembled in his private life. Hook's life revolves around work and workout, as highlighted on page 83. When he wasn't in the office, his idea of relaxation was either hitting the gym or going rock climbing. This dedication to physical fitness mirrors his approach to leadership, rigorous, disciplined and relentless. Tim Cook is a very, very health conscious person. So he gets up early because he wants to get to the gym before it gets crowded and before everybody else is getting up. His laser focus mirrored how he built Apple's new and improved supply chain. The key takeaways in this chapter for me is Cook's brilliance lay in finding the best people and partners, not trying to do everything in-house. He understood human skill is irreplaceable even in the age of technology. His demanding style was paired with the trust to empower his team. And Cook's focus extended into his personal life, mirroring the discipline he brought to Apple. This chapter shows the reader that Cook didn't just fix Apple. He built a culture of excellence down to every single detail. And it started with him, a leader whose life is the relentless pursuit of the best solutions. Now let's move forward and see how this transformation fueled Apple's rise to tech dominance. And now we are at chapter six, stepping into Steve Jobs' shoes from 2011 onwards. Inheriting Apple from a legend like Steve Jobs was a daunting task. For Tim Cook, his first CEO days weren't the meteoric rise the world had come to expect. Product launches were underwhelming, executive shakeups followed, and the Department of Justice lawsuit loomed. Cook's leadership was under fire right from the start. Apple's once stellar iPhone sales faltered against the rising Samsung, a threat analysts keenly noted. In a sign of the struggle, Cook fired Apple's head of Korean operations after just 17 months, as described at page 89. Apple's disappointing iPhone sales may have been due to the growing competition from Android. While Apple was still on top, Samsung was quickly becoming a threat with the company's name surfacing more and more in articles about Apple. In May, 2012, Apple was named the world's most valuable brand by Milward Brown's brand study for the second year in a row, 
Apple continues to innovate and maintain its luxury brand status, but faces future competition from Samsung, the study said. Now worth more than 14.1 billion, thanks in part to the success of its Galaxy handsets, Samsung is successfully outpacing Apple in a significant number of markets by positioning as a cool, well-priced alternative to the ubiquitous iPhone. In October 2012, Cook fired the head of Apple's Korean division. Dominic O, oh, due to sluggish sales in South Korea, home of Samsung. O oh had been in the job a mere 17 months. Then came more high-profile firings. First, Apple Store's John Browett, a man cut from Cook's own clothes, numbers-driven and efficient. It was a disaster. Customers had voiced concerns from the start, which Cook initially dismissed. I think you will be as pleased as I am, was his reply in the early days. He was wrong. Browett's cost-cutting clashed with Apple's customer-first ethos. Within six months, he was out and in a rare moment, Cook admitted the error as described on page 91 in the book. Making these changes in the stores was a mistake and the changes are being reversed. Our employees are our most important asset and the ones who provide the world-class service our customers deserve. Customer service, sales and marketing, it shows that not everything in a company is always about efficiency, streamlining and cutting costs. And also this wisdom is well understood by Tim Cook. More travel followed. Scott Forstall, a star under Jobs, oversaw the launches of Siri and Apple Maps, both disappointments. Siri's promise fell short and Apple Maps was a usability nightmare, so much so that Cook publicly apologized a humbling move Jobs would rarely, if ever, make, as described on page 95. He said, at Apple, we strive to make world-class products that deliver the best experience possible to our customers. With the launch of our new maps last week, we fell short on this commitment. We are extremely sorry for the frustration this has caused our customers, and we are doing everything we can to make maps better. Everything we do at Apple is aimed at making our products the best in the world. We know that you expect that from us and we will keep working nonstop until MAPS lives up to the same incredibly high standard. To some, Cook's apology was seen as a sign of weakness. According to The Week magazine, Cook's apology was a form of abasement that has some people saying that would never have happened if Steve Jobs were still alive. 2011-2012, the world watched and the criticism was harsh. Has Apple lost its cool to Samsung? A Wall Street Journal headline screamed. Yet Cook seemed unshaken. His leadership was different. He fired Forstall not just for the products, but for the man's disruptive politics and refusal to take ownership. On page 98, Kenny describes that uh, Tim Cook has the philosophy that goes like that. There can't be politics. I despise politics, Cook declared. The key takeaways in this chapter for me, even the best leaders face setbacks and the transition of power is never easy. Cook wasn't afraid to admit mistakes, an act of strength that contrasted with job style. He valued collaboration and accountability, dismissing those who prioritized their own agendas and politics in the company. This shows the reader that Cook's leadership wasn't about imitation, but finding his own rhythm. His was a steady hand, willing to correct course, but always holding firm to the values that made Apple great. Let's move on to the next chapter and see how Cook not only steadied the ship, but took Apple to heights even Jobs couldn't have predicted. Let's dive into it right away. Chapter 7, Finding His Feet with Hot New products. As described in the previous chapters, the early days saw critics doubting Tim Cook. 
Amidst falling share prices, he remained steadfast. We are focused on the long term, he said, page 114 in the book. This wasn't empty bravado, but a leader who understood success takes time. A lesson Europe once knew very well in the 90s. His vision wasn't just about iterations of existing devices, but disrupting whole new areas. Entering the healthcare industry, unheard of for a tech giant at the time, Cook launched HealthKit. With healthcare, he says on page 124, there is a wide open field to make some really profound contributions, he noted. Seeing the potential for health data to empower better care. Cook's leadership was also about transformation, not stagnation. From Apple stores meant to inspire, not just sell devices. To the bold Beats acquisition, he sought to deepen Apple's connection to its customers. As he later explained, people like the Beats founders aren't born every day. They get music deeply. It paid off and Apple Music soared, sometimes threatening to overtake Spotify itself. Then there was Apple Pay. Aiming to replace credit cards, Cook tackled a massive market while prioritizing what set Apple apart, user privacy. This combination of ambition and thoughtfulness defined his leadership. In 2014, this culminated in the Apple Watch, the first major product without Steve Jobs' input. The next chapter in Apple's story, Cook proclaimed. It was more than a hype. Apple Watch, alongside services like Apple Pay and Music, also keeping in mind his move towards the healthcare industry with data, fueled Apple's rise to a $3 trillion company and is a testament to Cook's ability to innovate beyond Jobs' shadow. Not covered in the book is his most recent move with the Apple Vision Pro, while unfortunately cancelling the Apple Car project. My key takeaways from these chapters are Hook understood the power of having a long-term vision even when facing criticism. He wasn't and isn't afraid to break into new markets, revolutionizing industries beyond just tech. He sought to expand Apple's influence from how we shop to how we listen to music. Apple Watch proved his ability not just to iterate, but to launch groundbreaking new products. This chapter shows Cook as a leader who could carry the legacy of Jobs' innovation and expand it into uncharted territories. A winning combination that would redefine what Apple could be. Now, let's have a look with the next chapters on his focus on value that transformed not just Apple's products, but its impact on the entire world and global society. Let's dive into it. Chapter 8, A Greener Apple. Historically, tech giants and environmental consciousness were rarely seen together. Tim Cook shattered that stereotype. Apple's approach to the environment under his leadership has been nothing short of a revolution, as described on page 147. His move wasn't just about greenwashing the company. It was a shift driven by a leader determined to make Apple a force for good. This transformation came to life with the massive 850 million California solar farm project. Cook's urgency is clear. The time for talk is past. The time for action is now. He understood that true sustainability meant not only taking action, but doing so in a way that benefits the broader community. This is why he ensured Apple's massive clean energy investments would leave others without options. Proof that profit doesn't have to come at the environment's expense. He even went beyond reducing Apple's direct footprint, dreaming of a future where products themselves become agents of change. He envisions the day we'd like to be able to build new products with just recycled materials as described on page 158. It's not about just technology. This is a vision for an industry transformation. 
Cook understands that real change requires transparency, sharing Apple's efforts with the world. Sustainability has become a huge part of Apple's culture. This isn't about hollow promises. It's a belief that Apple can leave the planet better than they found it. The key takeaways in this chapter is that Cook proves that environmental concern and leadership aren't solely the domain of younger companies. They can be core values driving business giants. He understands that sustainability is an ongoing journey, not a checklist requiring innovation in how we create and source materials. Cook's emphasis on transparency shows that the Green Apple isn't a PR stunt but the mission he wants the world to see. This chapter reveals that Cook isn't just a visionary in tech, he's a visionary for how business can be a force for good. It's this mindset that propelled Apple from an innovative tech company to a global leader with a conscience. Are you ready to explore now how his ethical focus shaped Apple's actions across the globe? Let's dive right into it. Chapter 9. Cook fights the law and wins. In an age of rampant data collection, Tim Cook's Apple stands apart. As artificial intelligence and cloud computing demand trust, privacy is more a feature. It's becoming Apple's core brand value. Cook understands that the power of these technologies depends on our willingness to share and that willingness hinges on companies that won't exploit our information. This commitment started with transparency. Apple publishes a report on government requests for user information, demonstrating a belief that our customers have a right to understand how their personal information is handled on page 165 in the book. Cook is clear. Apple has no interest in amassing personal information about our customers. This isn't just about compliance, it's about earning trust. This trust was put to the ultimate test when the FBI demanded Apple create a way to hack iPhones after a terrorist attack. Cook's open letter to Apple customers is a tour de force of principled leadership. We can and we must provide both privacy and security in equal measure. We believe that people have a fundamental right to privacy. Page 174 details his resistance. The US government has asked us for something we simply do not have and something we consider too dangerous to create. A backdoor to the iPhone. Cook's refusal was a bold affirmation of Apple's dedication to safeguarding user privacy even against governmental pressure. He recognized the danger. A backdoor isn't a one-time fix. Once created, it becomes a tool of potential abuse. He says, strong encryption is in our nation's best interest, page 170. Cook refused to let Apple become an arm of unchecked government power, calling the demand an attempt to undermine decades of security advancements that protect our customers on page 174. This wasn't a stance taken lightly. Risking the ire of his own government took courage, but for Cook, this was about an issue far greater than profit. My key takeaways from the chapter, Cook understands that in the artificial intelligence-driven future, privacy is a company's most valuable currency. Apple's privacy focus is more than just promises. It's reflected in bold action, even when it risks government backlash. Cook's stand shows that principles, not just products, define a great leader. This chapter reveals Cook as a visionary who recognizes that as technology becomes more powerful, Companies must choose between exploiting our trust and earning it. Apple, under his leadership, has made its choice. Are you ready to explore how this ethical focus has shaped Apple's actions across the globe? Let's dive into it in the next chapter. And here we go, chapter number 10, doubling down on diversity. For Tim Cook, 
Diversity isn't just a buzzword. It's a personal and transformative belief. His experiences as a gay man shaped his resolve. On page 186, he says, it's given me the skin of a rhinoceros, which comes in handy when you are the CEO of Apple. While intensely private, he realized his public coming out could be a catalyst for change. Also on page 186, Cook's personal revelation serves as a powerful testament to his character. Being gay, Cook explained, made him more empathetic and gave him the confidence to be himself, follow his own path and rise above adversity and bigotry. His decision to publicize his sexuality was motivated by a desire to support and inspire others facing similar struggles, showcasing his leadership by example. I felt I was valuing privacy too far above what I could do for other people. A quote on page 186. The response was overwhelming. Business icons from Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, to Disney's Bob Iger praised his leadership. But for Cook, making a difference meant more than just pronouncements. He saw diversity as Apple's lifeline. It's the future of our company. On page 193. Why this focus? For him, it's about maximizing talent. A diverse workforce means diverse perspectives, crucially in a global market. And he didn't stop at gender and race. Cook believes that true diversity encompasses any way you want to measure it. Recognizing that differing skills and ideas are as essential as backgrounds. Apple's commitment to diversity is further exemplified by Cook's stance on hiring. On page 194, Leanne Lacaney describes, the world is intertwined today much more than it was when I was coming out of school. Cook's leadership is characterized by embracing diversity in thought and background, fostering an environment where debate and respect coexist, propelling Apple forward. His team reflects this. Cook sought people who complemented his skills, not mirrored them. He believed that respectful debate, not blind consensus, fuels the best work. However, his vision wasn't without its challenges. Apple's 2014 diversity report was an open admission, a workforce still predominantly white and male, even within leadership. Cook wasn't about hiding this. Transparency was the first step towards action. He expanded his focus beyond hiring. Inclusion of the disabled in Apple products was a moral imperative. A basic human right. Cook's advocacy wasn't limited to tech. He believes businesses must be drivers of good, like pushing for coding in schools to empower the next generation. The key takeaways for me in this chapter, Cook's personal experiences shaped his fight for inclusion, proving it comes from the heart, not just a policy document. Diversity for Cook isn't about quota filling, but maximizing potential through different backgrounds and ways of thinking. He is not afraid of transparency, using data to identify areas for improvement, not for self-congratulation. Cook understands that building a more inclusive Apple also means making its products accessible to everyone. This chapter shows Cook as a leader willing to put his own privilege into action, creating a legacy that goes beyond elegant technology, one that makes Apple a champion for change. Are we ready to see how this focus shaped the new era of Apple's philanthropy and global outreach? Let's dive into the next chapter. Chapter 11, it's about a stop project. And uh, this chapter demonstrates that even as a CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world, you're not always winning. Chapter 11 is about robot cars and the future of Apple. Tim Cook inherited a titan, but growing it further would prove his true test as a leader. In 2018, Apple's one trillion valuation made history. While the iPhone's success under his tenor was undeniable, it also raised the question, what's next? Cook, ever mindful of Jobs' legacy, spoke of the company's mission to enrich 
our customers' lives and the lives of others. This wasn't about copycat products, but a continuation of the spirit that built Apple. Groundbreaking innovation that empowers people. This ambition came to life in Apple's secret car project. Like many of Apple's best ideas, it began small, mirroring a startup's hustle to prove itself. But ambition, as Apple would learn, doesn't guarantee success. Construction delays on Apple's stunning new spaceship headquarters meant to foster the very collaboration that empowered innovation foreshadowed challenges with Project Titan, the car initiative. The cancellation of the car project in March 2024 is not merely an end, but a recalibration of focus. It underscores the challenges inherent in pioneering new technologies and markets Reminding the reader that the path to innovation is fraught with risks and tough decisions. While the car project's cancellation might seem like a setback, it is also a testament to Apple's commitment to excellence and responsible decision making. Apple Park would become a symbol of this era. Beautiful, ambitious, yet also a reminder that execution matters as much as vision. Cook understood that creating this kind of workspace wasn't about imitating Silicon Valley trends. It was inspired directly by Jobs' insights after Cook visited Pixar, where chance encounters fueled creative breakthroughs. The iPhone X embodied this tension. A bold leap in design, it also carried a bold price tag. But Cook was unapologetic. We price to sort of the value that we are providing. For him, pricing was about more than profit. It was a statement of the revolutionary technology within. My key takeaways, Cook inherited a successful Apple, but the path to the next big thing wouldn't be easy, as evidenced by the setbacks with the car project. He sought to embody the job's legacy of innovation, not imitation, a mindset that pushed the boundaries even when results were uncertain. Apple Park was about fostering the environment of creative collision that powered Jobs' greatest successes, a reminder of the importance of company culture. The iPhone X, while commercially successful, highlights the balance between breakthrough design and market realities. This chapter shows that even with unprecedented success, Cook faces an ongoing challenge to chart a future that builds on the past while being ready for an unpredictable tech landscape and knowing when to cut losses and move on. Let's move to the last chapter and answer the question, who's Apple's best CEO? Chapter 12, the Best question at the end of the book, who's Apple's best CEO? The question is provocative. Could Cook be a better CEO for Apple than the legendary Steve Jobs? Heresy to some, but analyst Asimko Stereo makes a compelling case. Jobs was the visionary, the disruptor. Cook is the master operator, scaling those visions into a global behemoth. Job's genius was in the what, Cook's lies in the how. Let's not forget, Jobs initially handpicked Cook to run the complex machine that was Apple. He recognized Cook's strengths, complemented his own. And even amidst innovation, Jobs faced his share of struggles. Products like the iPod and iPhone burned overnight successes. Cook inherits this reality where even groundbreaking products need time and refinement. When I think back to the iPod, I think the iPod really took off when Steve Jobs combined it with the iTunes possibilities. Purchasing single songs was a real innovation back then. Also the iPhone, the initial iPhone was not really um, a product that uh, blew me away. It didn't even have uh, 3G. This was the new standard back in 2007 and 2008. It was just a simple smartphone. And it moved forward. And I think it really got a breakthrough when they worked on connecting it to the best networks available at the time. 
Page 230 challenges conventional wisdom with the suggestion that Tim Cook's generalist CEO approach was precisely what Apple needed as it grew into a global powerhouse. And Cook is well suited to running Apple in ways that Jobs was not. Where Tim Cook truly breaks away from Steve Jobs is in values-driven leadership. Apple today is inseparable from Cook's relentless focus on privacy, environmentalism, and inclusion. As one expert notes, strong ethics are moving from nice to have to business necessity. Cook is proving that a tech giant can be profitable and principled. Does this make him better than Jobs? That's for history to decide. But one thing's clear. Apple needed Jobs' disruptive genius to exist. It needs Cook's steady hand and ethical compass to thrive. Business is nothing more than a collection of people. Cook believes and Kaney describes on 237. His legacy isn't just about transforming Apple, but proving that the people behind the products matter just as much. The final key takeaways from this chapter, Cook isn't Jobs 2.0. His genius lies in operational excellence and steady leadership, vital for a company of Apple scale. Jobs' brilliance was in conceiving revolutionary products. Cook's is in making them accessible and sustainable. Cook's focus on ethics is transformative. He's showing that profit and values aren't mutually exclusive in the tech world. This chapter invites readers to consider that leadership is the one-size-fits-all model. Apple under Cook is undoubtedly a different company, but it's a question if it's better, not just as a business, but as a force in the world. My key takeaways, application, personal reflection and critique on the book. As I now draw this exploration to a close, it's time to reflect on the indelible mark Tim Cook has left on Apple and more broadly on the tech industry and society itself. From the detailed account of his journey, several key lessons emerge, lessons that are not just theoretical, but immensely practical for anyone aspiring to lead in the fast-paced, ever-evolving world we have today. Tim Cook's journey reveals vital truths for anyone seeking to build a lasting and impactful organization. Here is the breakdown. Education matters. Cook's technical mastery and business acumen prove the power of deep understanding. It's not just about degrees, but the commitment to lifelong learning, a trait shared by figures like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and also Steve Jobs. Embrace risk. Cook's bold move into the young personal computer industry, joining Apple when it teetered on the edge of bankruptcy, shows the potential rewards of stepping outside the comfort zone. Health is a leader's asset. Entrepreneurship is often linked to a frenetic pace. Cook's prioritization of health is a reminder that the leader's well-being directly impacts the companies. Profit and principles can coexist. Apple under Cook challenges the stereotype of the ruthless corporation. His focus on the environment Diversity and ethics proves that the business can be both wildly successful and a force for good. Cook plays the long game. Cook's rise took decades. True success isn't an overnight phenomenon. It demands a long view and a passion that can fuel a lifetime of work. Reflecting personally on Tim Cook's narrative, what strikes me the most is the profound humanity that underpins his leadership. In a world where leaders are often celebrated for their ruthlessness, Cook's story is a refreshing reminder that kindness, ethics, and the commitment to making the world a better place are the hallmarks of truly transformative leadership today. Tim Cook is a lodestar for aspiring builders. Too often, we focus on failure as a teacher. While there's value there, Cook's example is inspirational. His story isn't about luck or the perfect idea, but a deep understanding of his industry, risk-taking, and the relentless drive to build not just a company, but a better world for the future of our kids. While inspirational, the book at times feels overly focused on Cook's virtue, 
bordering on hero worship. A more nuanced look at the complexities of running a multinational corporation would have added that. Yet in celebrating Cook's achievements, I must also acknowledge the complexities and challenges of leading a tech behemoth in today's world. A deep exploration into the dilemmas and criticisms faced during his tenure would have provided a more rounded perspective, offering valuable lessons in navigating the ethical minefields of modern business. Overall, Tim Cook's story is a powerful reminder that transformational leadership isn't confined to flamboyant founders. It can be found in the diligence operator, the risk taker, and the leader who believes that business can be a force for good. The legacy is one worth emulating. Are you inspired by Tim Cook's journey? Do you want to learn more about his leadership and the inner workings of Apple? Then... This book is really for you. Becoming Tim Cook, the inside story of Apple's rise to the top is a must read. Click the affiliate link to purchase the book on Amazon in the description and support the show with this small donation. Tim Cook's story is more than a peek behind the scenes at the tech giant. It's a masterclass in determination, values-driven leadership and the often unglamorous work that builds something truly exceptional. But the journey of transformative leaders doesn't stop here. Join me in April and May as I will dive into the controversial and captivating story of Elon Musk. His relentless ambition and often unorthodox methods promise a fascinating discussion. Stay tuned.